Welcome to another exciting Bible study with Reverend Dr. James A. Duncan, pastor of Shiloh Baptist Church. Faith study in the Word is designed to keep you fired up about your walk with the Lord. Fired up about our faith study in the Word with Pastor Duncan, author, teacher, and long-term educator with a burning desire to see every believer live a full life of faith in the redeeming power of God. This can only happen when we develop a hunger and thirst for studying the Word, God's Word. Thanks for joining us in tonight's study.
but the power stopped from heaven because of what he did in his walk. All I'm saying as I get there is I want to show you how to make sure you don't stop God's power. In this text, there are some identified power stoppers from Jesus Christ that can help you find your way of getting a blessing to get blessing from God. So right now, here's what I need you to do. You got Samson? I want you to see Judas. Now you know Judas, one of the disciples of Jesus Christ, and here he was walking with Jesus for three years, but he decided to sell Jesus out for his self righteousness. He knew more than God. Samson was caught up in his form of self-righteousness where he, after God delivered him, when he got back to his full strength, he started living in God's way. That's what some of us do. We forget we need God. I'm talking to somebody out there, just because things are going well now don't mean you can act like you have the strength and the power to keep yourself. Look at Judas, walking with Jesus, sold Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver, Watch this. Now he's hanging from a tree. All the power of God went out of his life because of his self-righteousness. One more. I want you to see Saul. Mighty King Saul. Even though the people asked for a king, God chose Saul. He was a, a foot and a head taller than everybody else. Here is Saul now. He was standing there, but at the end of his life, he went and tried to raise up the spirit of Samuel. He went to the witch to try to do a seance. How can a once mighty man go to a witch to do a seance? Here is what I want to tell you. No matter how close you are to God, what the radical sermon on the might is, Mount is saying, that there's times when you stop God's power. We're going to talk about it. Please, go with me. This is very important. You... Right now, in your life, there could be something you're doing. It doesn't mean God still has the power. God wants to give you the power, but you stop the power by the way that you've been living. So tonight, um, we're going to look at, and I want you to see this up here with me. As I go to it, we're going to look at the sixth chapter, Power Stoppers. Let me slow down so you can get it. This gospel, Sermon on the Mount, is one of the most radical views of heaven we've ever seen. Here is Jesus telling us, I've empowered you, but you've got to learn to live this way. In chapter 5, Jesus worked with our heart. He shared with us that our wicked heart, or the wickedness of our heart, can stop the power of God. In this chapter, he's showing us, now that I've shown you how to get your heart straight, now I have to work on your actions or how to produce a quality life that will help you walk in the power of God. Are you interested tonight? I'm going to show you how to walk in the power of God, how to get real power from God because you believe it. What am I saying? This chapter is going to be how to receive kingdom power. How do we get it from God? How do we receive it? In chapter 5, as I just told you, you heard two things that kept me in sin. In that chapter, look here. Jesus said, I'm confronting from the Beatitudes down to the end of the chapter. I'm confronting all of you religious leaders who's twisted the word of God and did like you wanted to live. I'm confronting you tonight. I'm confronting you. No. He said, and what I want you to know is this was marked with you have heard it said, and yet I said. Two things kept me going forth, repeating himself in that fifth chapter. You have heard it said, yet I say. You've heard what people are saying, now let me show you how to walk in kingdom power. Let me show you what I said, or what's really happening in heaven. So that's the power. Jesus now builds our new hearts with actions, so he's going to show us how to walk in the power in the kingdom. So I want you to write the word power stoppers down, and let's go. Let's take this trip. The Sermon on the Mount, Therefore, it gets more challenging every time. But do you realize that this challenge that we're about to look at now is one where God has some expectations in three areas. He's going to show us how we stop the power of God in our life. He's going to show us how our self-righteousness can kill God's power. He's going to show us that he's given us everything we need, but we need to understand his power. This is a way to inherit the realm. And I like this word here. I want you to see this. 
of the ungrieved spirit of God. Do you know that some of the things you do and I do grieve God's spirit? Some of the things that you and I do, God up in heaven is sorrowful because he wants to give us so much more, but we grieve his spirit by our actions. He said, I taught you this, but you grieve my spirit by your actions. You know better than this. Come on, I'm not the only one that I've done some things and I said I wish I hadn't done them and I didn't realize that I had grieved God's spirit. But to get to the ungrieved spirit of God, you have to understand what Matthew 6, 1 through 4 said. Let's read it so you know what the text is saying. Be careful not to practice oh, your righteousness. That's so important. In front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. Be careful that you're not practicing your righteousness instead of God's righteousness because when you do, you lose your reward. Watch this. You break off a connection from God. Well, God, uh, I'm doing the best I can. Or I'm not like other people. That's not good enough. Remember chapter 5. The whole chapter was about your, your righteousness must exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees and scribes. You can't compare yourself religious people and then say, well, I'm doing good because of that. No, God gave each of us a standard to live by and some of us have been saved a long time and we still aren't living up to the standard we know how to live by and it's not because of God, it's because maybe the way you're living you are stopping the very power that you're asking for. Watch this. I, I love these first four verses. It says, so when you give to the need, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets. Come on, go to Matthew 6, we went through 4 with me. Uh, to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. Ooh, I can't wait to go explain it. And then verse 3 tells us, But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. God, are you, what are you saying? My, my left hand can't know what my right hand is doing. God said, I am so sincere about you not being self-righteous that sometimes if you have to not let your flesh know what you're doing in the spirit, you cannot get so excited about who you are and what you're doing. You may get the blessing from God. But when you walk in self-righteousness, and I'm going to show you what that is, you now have cut off the power of God. I am very serious tonight. Somebody right now, God wants to empower, and the only thing stopping him is what's in chapter 6 in the Beatitudes. Let's go. Verse 4. It says, Jesus introduced this section with a negative, in fact, two negatives. Watch this. So watch how he does. Be careful not to do. So he's saying, be there is a Greek word that means always carry in your mind. Be mindful of what you're doing. Don't keep oops, I messed up. You can't keep oops in when you've been in church all your life. All of us got this, oops, I messed up. Because we have the mercy and grace of God, sometimes we feel that we can just say oops and everything will be all right. But God is saying, that's cool. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to still love you. I'm going to still be with you. But you just cut off the power that you need to survive. And how did you do it? Because you weren't careful. Look at the negative. He said, be careful not to. Crazy sense and structure, right? But what he's trying to show us is, be careful not to. And then he's going to give us what not to do. Or you will lose your reward. Now, I need to tell you, the reward God is talking about is not only in heaven. The reward God is talking about is the reward you get. Have you ever had a spring day? It don't have to be a good season, what I call a good season, a winter day. Any day with God is a good day. But you ever seen the snow blanketed and you're riding down around the road and your house is safe and you got heat and you got money and everything is good and you look outside the beauty of nature catches you and you find yourself walking with a God that although you don't see with your physical eye, your spirit has been intensified by the beauty of nature, those are the things you miss when you're deceitful in your spirit. God says, be careful not to 
act like you're not thinking when you keep oops, messing up. Somewhere along the line, you have to let the Holy Spirit kick in and stop you from doing that. I'm talking to somebody right now. I feel it. I know you got it. Watch this. Except for the section on the Lord's Prayer, much of Matthew is filled with the negatives. How not to give. That's what we're going to talk about. How not to pray. How not to fast. Here are the areas that are going to hold some blessings into God's word for us. We're going to be talking about how not to give. The way you shouldn't give up. How not to pray. Maybe your prayer life is wrong. How not to fast. Quit fasting and not getting the benefits of it because you're not trusting God for the benefits. Not laying up treasures on the earth and not to work. So all these things are in this sixth chapter. How not to give, how not to pray, how not to worry, how not to lay up treasures. All of these things, how not to fast. God is saying, I'm giving you the how nots because what you're doing might fit one of those how nots and you stop the power. If you're in a room with somebody, you better tell them, watch out for those power stoppers. Maybe we'll never get our prayer answered until we slow down and understand what God is saying. This is so good. This is necessary teaching. We are all by nature self-righteous because of the wickedness of our heart. So don't say I'm not talking to you. And don't, and don't identify your partner. <laughs> and don't identify everybody in the room but you. The Bible tells us all of us are wicked by nature. As a matter of fact, the most wicked thing in the world, God says, is our heart. He said our heart is deceitful among all things. What is he talking about? God is saying that a lot of times I get tricked by my own heart. My heart deceives me, and then I fall. Come on, go with me. And then I find out i got to reach back up for God. Go with me. I find God. He anoints me again. I get out of my mess. But I still let my wicked heart go back doing what it was doing. Psalms 51 and 10. David found this out. Now, the mighty David, who was the king, uh, who was a man after God's own heart, who was a psalmist, songwriter, who God loved, look what he said. After his fall, look what he asked God to do. Maybe some of you should ask God to do that because self-righteousness flows from our wicked heart when we're not careful or keep our heart under control. I'm talking to somebody, you have to make sure that you just aren't looking at other folks' wickedness and can't see the stuff you have to deal with in your own heart. David got himself to that point. After sleeping with Bathsheba, killing Uriah, David, he didn't go to God and say, Lord, forgive me. David figured it out. He said, Lord, create in me a pure heart and give me a steadfast or renewed spirit. They better be careful again. He said, God, I'm tired of messing up. Please change my heart. Can somebody say fix my heart? And God can fix your heart and that will be the change. There's two views of good works in this text. So let's look at it so we understand. When we compare the good works that Jesus mentioned in Matthew 5, 16, to the acts of righteousness he mentions in Matthew 6, it is obvious that he's contrasting righteousness. So let me explain that. In Matthew 16, I think I, I think I put it in the text. Yeah, I did. He says, let, says to let others see your good works. Um, but Matthew 6, 1, where we're reading says, to not let them see your good works. There is no contradiction. He's saying, Matthew 16, I want others to see the good works that I'm doing in the will of God. I want God to get the glory. He said here, 6-1 is talking about when you want others to see your good work so you can get the glory. You got it. There are things we do so people can just pat us on the back and say, wow, you really are spiritual. We want, we want people to say how deep we are. We'll speak in tongues sometime. We'll go, no tongue come. Just so you can prove to people how deep you are. Sometimes you're in worship, you'll look over, you'll mind them straight, you'll see somebody else worship, and you start clapping like you've been worshiping. Get out of here. You just did that because you saw Sister Stone so all anointed, and you don't want to be left behind in the anointing. So you started acting like they did. But watch this. Here's the difference. I'm going to show you that if your good works are the good works that are in 516, they're a blessing to God. That's the one where you don't let your light, let your light shine and make sure that you're not, you know, hiding your light and you're salt of the earth. That's good work. 
But here he's saying, come on, don't do things just to bring attention to you. Please hear me tonight. I gave you three tragedies to start this teaching off. Samson, Saul, and Judas all got caught up in self-righteousness, had tremendous potential, and lost their blessings because of God. How about you and me? I know there's been days when I messed up and it was all about me and it was not about God. And God had to bring me back to a place where I understood I needed him. Here's how it's summed up by F.F. Bruce. He said nicely, watch this, this is a good saying if you write something down. Show what you are tempted to hide and hide what you are tempted to show. That is so good. Show what you're tempted to hide, meaning don't be ashamed of the gospel. You know, sometimes we get in the crowd and, and you know, we all say in church, but we sometimes hide our gospel, or hide our real feelings about God. No, I'm telling you, if you get feeling something good in the shop right even if you're waiting in line now because of the virus, sometimes the spirit of hit you, you gotta let people know, I'm just worshiping my God who has been good. But he says, you also need to hide what you're tempted to show. That's what I'm talking about tonight. Get into the spirit of this and you'll see something. 516 suggests we must overcome the temptation of cowards. That's what I just told you. Matthew 6 and 1 points to the temptation to vanity. There's cowardice, you might have got, uh, God, you're my secret lover. You know, uh, I love you, death, sir. But God said, you're a coward out in the world until you need me. And then he said, there's people with vanity. All you do is show me, show me off so you can get glory. So there's two kinds of righteousness. Come right down. Two kinds of righteousness. There's another way to contrast these two kinds of righteousness. There is a moral righteousness. And there is a religious righteousness. So here's what God is saying. Moral righteousness is when you understand that everything I do needs to bring glory to God and I have to live right whether everybody around me lives right or not. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. Sometimes we get caught up in, in trying to uh, show off instead of trying to step back and letting God be seen through us. But then religious righteousness is where I'm just going through motions. I'm really not doing, I'm really not who I say I am, but I'm showing you a picture that makes you think that's who I am. Go back here and watch me. Here's what I'm saying. The moral righteousness is when your life reflects the word of God. And the religious righteousness is when your life reflects, I'm going to point something out to you, an unsanctified ego. That's not my word. I got research and there's a, there's a, a bibliography attached to this study. Because I love that word. The preacher said it's an unsanctified ego. Isn't that something? Everything about me can love God in church. But when my ego wants to be massaged and wants somebody to know who I am, we will jump up in anybody's face because an unsanctified ego pulls in evil. Matter of fact, we can start feeling so bad about who we are and how people are treating us and they don't pay no attention to me when the only person you should be trying to please is God. Is your heart right with God? Has God seen your work? If nobody on earth ever sees what you do when you leave here, man, you're going to step into glory. They're going to have a little apartment and you're going to get a great big condo because God's going to say, everything you did was for my glory. Watch this. So religious righteousness is from an unsanctified ego. It's an ego that says, I want to get the blessing. So in this section, the unsanctified ego versus moral righteousness is exposed in the three areas that we're going to talk about. Here go the three areas. You can look down the text and you can see on yourself. Jesus said, I'm going to show you how your ego is wrong when you're giving alms. Talk about your money. When you pray. Talk about the sincerity of your prayer and when you fast. I sure hope there's some fasters out there. But in Jesus' time, these were the three religious circuses. You could put on a circus. You could just act. Man, you could come up and give alms and let everybody know. You could pray and just pray long prayers out of pretense. But all you were doing was showing off who you were. And then the last thing you could do is you could fast. But when you fast, you tore your face up. Somebody asked you how you're doing, you say, oh, 
Mm-hmm. You've been telling yourself, asking, but you act like you're about to die. I'm just trusting God. Whenever you run into people that always want to tell you, you know, oh, honey, I fast pray two weeks first a year. I fast pray for a day. When they got to do that, sometimes it's not for God. It's for you to think who they are. God is saying, keep that to yourself. Say it with Keep that to yourself. So we're going to look at those three areas, how much you give. First, look what he said. Be careful. Take heed that when you do your charitable works, in the King James, it says, when you give alms, almsgiving, before men to be seen by them, otherwise you have no reward by your Father in heaven. Once you get a reward for giving what you've given, you have no reward from God. Let's talk about this, because this is very dangerous. We're still talking about power. So, what am I saying when God says to power? Jesus addresses the danger of cultivating your church image, but it not be who you really are on the inside. Because believe it or not, you got yourself fooled. And I dare say that not only are you missing that connection of power with God, you miss what God really has for you down here on this earth. Because that's driven by my ego. Remember, our ego is never satisfied. We want to be, the, we want to have the most, we want to be the biggest, we want to be the prettiest, we want to be everything we can be, instead of realizing that if we humble ourselves, God will exalt us. I'm helping somebody. You are probably the best thing going with God. You're getting a connection with God's power. You're living, nobody knows about God, but isn't that good enough? Isn't it good enough for you that God sees when you pray extra prayers? Isn't it good enough for you that God sees you ride down the road and you begin to praise? Isn't it good enough that God sees you hold back your anger? That's where the reward comes from. But when you do it so men can see, wow, then you got your reward. Whenever I say, oh, look how big you are, look how good you are, that's what you live for. The rewards of the world instead of the rewards of God. Three deadly signs of self-righteousness. Pick these out so, so you can see and know whether or not you're a self-righteous person. So I want you to judge yourself. Look at this because there's a danger sign. There's, there could, there's 10 or 12 I could have picked, but I only picked these three because I want you to see. The number one sign, write this down. Self-righteous people parade their good works around. The Pharisees and scribes are the perfect picture of self-righteousness. The first thing self-righteous pe- people do is they start telling you all they're doing for the Lord. Oh, I done been in choir verse five times this week. I'm getting tired. And then I had to pray, and I went over to such and such house. And if you got to sit and rehearse and tell me that, maybe you're not doing it for the right reason. Self-righteous people want people to know how much they do. They sit around, and, and they wonder why God can't bless that. Look what the scripture says. I love this text. It says... For that reason, they love to publicly display their righteousness to people. They were wearing their righteousness on the outside. The scribes and the Pharisees, Matthew 23, 7, write it down. Matthew 23, 7 tells us they love to be greeted with respect in the marketplace and to be called rabbi by others. Do you know I've gone to places and people didn't recognize me as a pastor or as you know, the great Reverend Duncan. And I had to learn that I'm better off when I take a low seat and someone calls me up than I am walking in looking all big and expect somebody to greet me. You know what I mean? Like when I was growing up, when the preacher came to the house, uh, the preacher got the big piece of chicken. That's just true. Anybody out there grew up in the Baptist church understand what I'm saying? I remember we had to eat after the preacher eat. I used to look at that preacher and say, man, look at him with that breast. And all they leave me to eat backs. Just know they leave us the, the wings. They leave us the backs. And we sit there eating chicken back. And the preacher came in the house eating up all the chicken. I don't, I don't want nobody to get upset. The preacher gets the big piece of meat. All I'm telling you is that's fine if God gives it to you. But don't start expecting. Because now you're getting your glory and not God's glory. Number two, self-righteous people are uncompassionate. Ooh, watch this. Being self-righteous makes you a person without much compassion. Why? Because you see other people full of sins and faults, and you don't understand why they are that way. Are you kidding me? 
I don't understand why such and such so easy. That's because you haven't looked at yourself. I don't understand how you can do that. Can I tell you something? Please don't judge what other people do because you never know when that's going to be you. You might be the one doing the same thing. You haven't been in a situation, but you don't see your faults. You see everybody else's. Matthew 7 and 3, right again, watch this. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? God is saying, how is it that you can see every speck of sawdust in my eye, but you can't see the big plank, the big piece of wood in your own eye? He said, because self-righteous people are not compassionate. They just want to believe everybody's so bad except them. And the third one, this is a good one. Self-righteous people reject correction. Oh, if you live with a self-righteous person, they know everything. When you correct them, and even when they're wrong, they will not accept correction. I want you to see what God calls a person who does not accept correction. By the time when you need to be corrected, pride sets in and you become unteachable. But Proverbs 12 and 1, whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but whoever hates correction, let me get out of the way here, is stupid. Now, I didn't say that. That's the NIV translation. Whoever loves correction will love knowledge. Whoever loves the discipline will love knowledge. But who doesn't, God said, it's really stupid for me to have all this power for you and you don't want to walk in that power. Okay, I, I got you now. I see somebody's looking. Yeah, they maybe there's something talking about power. So when you give your alms, do not announce it with trumpets as hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. This is talking about when the scribes and Pharisees gave alms, almsgiving was a sign that you were connected to God. So in biblical time, when they gave their alms, they wanted everyone to see. They would even wait, because there's no evidence in the Bible that there's any place we can find an example of someone blowing a trumpet before they gave. So, that's, so what we believe theologically is, not that they were blowing the trumpet, but it's talking about on the feast day. Whenever there was a big feast and they were in their royal, you know, robes and they were looking real good, they'd wait till the trumpets blow announcing the feast and they would be the first ones to walk by the alms table and give alms so someone could see it. Can I tell you something that's dangerous? When you parade your wealth, when you parade your talents, when you parade your gifts, you're in danger of losing them. Jesus said it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to get in heaven. Or he said it this way, you can't love God and man. Listen to me. Everything you got, God gave you. And when you stop honoring God, you can lose it. So don't brag about what you're giving. Maybe there's someone else out there that wants to give and can't give because they don't have as much as you. Look at the widow, the poor widow that was going by the table and giving. She gave one penny and Jesus said she gave more than everyone else because she gave from her heart. So just because you have a lot today, please don't take it for granted. And don't be like the hypocrites in the synagogue. We're going to talk about that. What do I mean by the hypocrites in the sky? It was the custom uh, to draw attention to themselves. I just told you. It was a, a, on the feast days, on these occasions, they would go out and make sure somebody saw them. But here's the problem. These occasions afforded golden opportunities. I'll give you a big word here. Ostentation. When you are ostentatious, you are a person that loves to flex your Christian muscles on stuff God gave you. I am so sure that everything I have and all I am belongs to God, that when I'm tempted to act like I'm smart enough, I'm talented enough, you know, I got enough strength, that I, I back that thing down because I have been so far down, I realize had it not been for God, do I have anybody else understanding that had it not been for God, I wouldn't be as well off as I am right now because the reality is when you get a moment where you can shine, that's what this word really means, shine, really trouble. 
When you shine, God is saying, please let me shine, not you. Let me shine. Give me the glory, not you. Because when we don't, when we give to God in selfish righteousness, we lose according to this text. We lose what? I'm going to share with you what you lose. You lose God's power, but you also lose our reward in heaven. We get our reward when people praise us. I just shared with you, I was going to talk about Samson, but we talked about that. We take God's glory because we tell the world we have the power without God. Look at me. King Nebuchadnezzar. So first of all, we lose because we want people to think that we have the power. But second, we lose because King Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 4, you know what he did? He got a nerve. You ever did this in your spit level or in your car, in your house? He started walking around his house about, look at this great kingdom I have built. God controlling every breath in his body. Look at how, look at this job I got. Uh, look at my beautiful husband. Look at my beautiful, well, I'm now your children. You better watch it. Because the reality is, the Bible said in that fourth chapter, verse 23 and 35, from at that moment, because he stole God's glory, God allowed him to run through the fields like a wild animal. Somebody said, what are you talking about? Well, the description in the Bible almost compared it to a werewolf. But what I'm trying to tell you is, you may not be a werewolf, but I bet you I know what can happen. Start bragging and not give God the glory. You can have some very raggedy years in your life. You can have some times when, even though you got money, you have no peace. You, you have some times where you got beauty, but you're, you're an ugly person on the inside and nobody wants to be near you. All God is saying, as soon as you take me out of the equation, soon as, oh, somebody listening to me. As soon as you take God out of your life, you stop the power, but you also miss the opportunity to get your reward, which is that daily walk with God. So we take God's glory because we tell the world, look at me. And also we stop God's power by losing our covenant position. I don't have time, so understand that. Everything in your life is based on a covenant. How can I say it? You are like the prodigal son. You go to the big pen, you spend your money, you get freaky with stuff, you run around on the streets, and when you turn around, God's still there. Wow, know why he's still there? He got a covenant with you. Aren't you glad your covenant with God is not based on you, but the covenant with God is based on God? So what he's saying is, but if you begin to take my glory, you lose your covenant position. Stay with me now. That's when I say position. Here's your position. God had plans to raise you up to a higher height, mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually, and, uh, you know, financially, if you want to have on that. But God said, since you don't want to give me the glory, then you cut off my ability to continue the covenant with you. All I can do, here's, here's a covenant, we, here's what we break our covenant down to. We break God's covenant down to a rescue operation. You're always looking for God to rescue you. Lord, give me, God says, wait a minute. I have a covenant where you can live higher than you are if you would just give me the glory. Deuteronomy 8.18, I love this verse. But remember, the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. And so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. Here's what he's saying. Don't think of wealth as money. Wealth is joy in tribulation. Wealth is peace when the money is money. Wealth is trusting when you don't see a reason to trust. All I'm saying to you is that God is saying, my covenant is more important to you than anything, but when you walk in self-righteousness, you lose that covenant ability. When we give to the need, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you in open. Can you look at verse 4? I was a little puzzled when I started researching that verse, because here's what God is saying. I was going to say, God, how can my left hand not know? He's not talking about physically that your left hand wouldn't know, but he was giving you it is, such, it is so important to me that you got not get caught up in your own abilities and your ability to give that you somehow get to a spiritual place where you're not even tempted to act like you were giving it on your own. 
You know what he's saying? When he's saying the left hand should know what the right hand is doing, he's saying, get so you have been so, you, you love God so much, you're so in love with God, you're so involved in what God is doing, you want so much from God. Is there any hungry people out there? Get to the point where you hunger so much from God that you don't even want, you don't even want to think about what you're giving because you know where it came from. All you want to do is give God glory for what you have to give. Oh, I love it. And here is the blessing. God will bless you in open for what you do in secret. Underline that in your Bible. You can write your Bible. If you got a cell phone or you got a, you know, a tablet, write it down somewhere. It is worth you doing stuff secretly, continuing to do stuff in secret to know that God is a God who rewards openly what we do in secret. How do I know? Because the Bible tells us when we don't let our right hand know, when we make sure we hide stuff even from ourselves, even though you know we can't we can't really uh, uh, you know hide stuff from ourselves. He says, when I see in secret, I reward in open. I'm gonna help somebody. You can get a clean slate tonight. Forget everything you did. Start over. Saying, God, you know what? Instead of me being just grown because it looked like you know sister so and so and. Brother so-and-so was being raised up, and here I am serving you best I can, and I don't know why the blessings don't come to me. God said, quit it. Stop it. Stop it, and remember, you wouldn't have what you have without God now. Here's what he said. I'm going to give you three people that nobody thought were anything, but when they were doing stuff in secret, Gideon, God came to Gideon and said, now, remember, they were under siege. Gideon was actually, you know, actually doing, uh, pounding whey, grain, and wheat in secret. But you know what happened? God came to him and said, Thou mighty man of God. Oh, here's what God is saying. I see what you do in secret. I see all the people jumping around and all the ones that want to show up, but I see you pressing every day. I see you pushing. I see your tears. I see your joy over the little things I do. I see you holding back your anger. I see you allowing people to do stuff to you and you continue to say, I want to represent God. Moses, hey, look, he started out his life being picked up out of the Nile River. Think about Moses. Went to the live in Pharaoh's house. Then was a murderer out in the desert. Everybody had forgot about him. He had a price on his head. Please don't get upset because you're a criminal. God uses criminals. Hallelujah. God uses folks who don't have anything good going for them. All right, come on. Don't make me get to a preacher mode because I'm about to shout right now off of this. Aren't you glad who God uses? Come on, somebody here tell me you're glad that God uses folks who ain't right. And how many here would say, I, there's times I was not right before I came to God, but he chose me anyhow. And there's other times he knows my heart is trying to do what's right. And God said, because you're doing that in secret, uh, come on, you're just a hideous thing. But you know what? I see every tear you cry. I see every time you go before me and say, God, it's me again. I'm sorry. You know what he said? I'll reward you in open. And look at David. David, when they went to choose a king, Jesse put all his sons out instead of David. And he said, David don't look like much. But God said, no, it was David in the field singing to me. It was David in the fields killing the bear and the lion by faith. It was David who would make sure he took his shepherd's rod and kept his father's sheep, just like Jesus, who is our shepherd, keeps us corralled. And look what God did. When they were looking for somebody, he was a ruddy boy. But you know what God said? I'm going to bless David. Even though the world can't see who he is, that's all I'm blessed. Now, I guarantee you, there's somebody listening to me right now. The world thought you were nothing, but look how God has made you last and raised you up and got you to the place where you don't have to worry about, am I going to make it? Because you are so deep in your foundation with God. You realize how much he loves you, and you know he's going to keep blessing you. How do you know that? Because there's times when I wasn't worthy, and he blessed me anyhow. Ooh, not just times. Come on. There's days when I know I was just off. But somehow, I realized that if I, in secret, my heart is right. We started with the heart. Then he will bless me in open. Yeah, yeah. How do you pray? So, the second way to determine if your righteousness of unsanctified ego or moral righteousness is how you pray. So, we just looked at how we get it. 
Make sure God gets the glory. When I start talking about prayer, a lot of times people say, oh, I know all about prayer. No, you don't. Because if we did, we would understand something about Matthew 5. Look at Matthew 6 and 5. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the marketplace of the synagogues or on the street corners to be seen of others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their rewards. Now, if I could contrast that, and I know we're in the COVID-19 world, but if you only pray when you're in church, when people ask you, or if you only pray, maybe you're on a Zoom call, I don't know what you're on, Periscope, and you want to pray, now you want to pray like you're the most powerful prayer in the world. You have to even read your Bible all week. God said, that's showing up. That's just, that's a hypocrite, right? He said, you're just putting on a show. That's, that's an act. Now, we all know that the word hypocrite comes from two Greek words, which means an actor or showy. There's some of us who put on a show for God. We try to represent. You know what actor does? An actor plays a character that he is not. So God said, you're praying, trying to pray this deep prayer when you know you're not deep. But what you're doing is nobody else knows, so you start acting. Ooh, y'all just don't start shaking and you got shit. Y'all just don't know how I love the Lord. And you start, and God is saying, will you please cut? Sometimes I just need two words of sincerity. Lord, I'm sorry. In the prayer. But not us. We want to go into long prayers so people will know we know how to pray. I've seen people pray uh, in groups and they try to outpray each other instead of talking to God. What's your prayer be? How do you pray? Watch this. He's saying, But when you pray, go into your secret closet. Everybody got one, right? You got a closet? Okay, you should have a place. Pray to your... Let me stop. Everybody here should have a place you can go cry. Everybody listening to me should have a secret place you can go be honest. When, when, when you have that breakdown, you're going to have one. If you haven't had one, keep, keep living in this cool world. You're going to have a moment of breakdown. You're going to have a moment of unfeigned mental tragedy, a collapse. And God is saying, do you have a place where you meet me? I don't know where your place is. I don't even want to know. But you better get you a place. You better have a place you run to so your world doesn't fall apart. He said, go to your secret closet. Then your father who sees what is done in secret. All of this is the same. I'll reward you in open if you're serious in secret. And when you pray, do not keep babbling like the pagans do, making long prayers. You ever had those people in church you don't want to pray because you know they're going to pray a long time just to show you they know how to pray a long time, but they're not saying nothing. It's just about them. And you're sitting there with your eyes, you know, you're peeking and stuff, trying to figure out when they're going to stop. Because you know there's no anointing in that prayer. But they keep going on and on so they can show you. And no, they're going to show you everything they know how to do. And all they're doing is killing the spirit of God. Let's go into some teaching. Let's watch this. How do you pray? Do not be like them for your father knows what you need before you ask. I'm going to hang on that and be close tonight. Watch this. God knows what you need before you ask. Can you give him praise right there? When I saw this in the text, if I decide... To not live by my unsanctified ego, self-righteousness, and I decide to live a moral life based on these beautiful pictures I see in the Sermon on the Mount. My life changes and God says, the reason you got out of what you were in is because I know what you need before you ask. Isn't that awesome? God knows what you need before you even ask him what it is. That is enough to follow him. Tonight, you're sitting there asking for stuff, and God said, if you would just follow me morally, I'm going to supply. And I know there's people out there, if you had a chance to testify through this, you know, this live session, you can talk back to me, no chat room tonight. You can tell somebody, I know that's right. When I needed this, God met my need. I don't know how God did it, but God met my need. How do we know? Because this text tells us, when you're sincere, God says, I know what you need even before you ask. That is beautiful, man. That is powerful when God says that. The way he treats prayer in these verses is two sets of negatives and positives. Follow the verse. First negative tells us how not to pray. Verse six, uh, chapter 6, verse 5. Look at verse 5. 
it tells us, while well, the first tells us how not to pray, six tells us how to pray. Verse six of chapter six tells us how to pray. So I want you to write that down. Make sure you got that. If you want to know, how do I start off my prayer? What should my thought life be? Verse five tells you what your thought life should be. Verse six tells you, uh, I mean, verse six tells you how to pray. Verse five tells you what you shouldn't be thinking about when you pray. The second negative tells us further how not to pray. Six, verse seven and eight. While the second positive tells us how to pray. And we're not going to get to that tonight. That's the Lord's Prayer. I'm saving that. Uh, you're going to see the Lord's Prayer turn inside out like you've never seen it before. Just the, just the fact that it's the Lord's Prayer. You know, we, we sometimes have lost the ability to understand how awesome that is. That God will give us the connection to get to Him. It's His prayer. How, I, I gotta stop. I, I gotta finish this so I can get there next week. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites. Jesus assumed. So here's two assumptions. He assumed that he that his disciples would give. That's what he started in alms. So if you're not a giver, you're not in this conversation. Then he said he assumed. That's why he told him the right way to give. But also he assumed that his disciples would pray. He just he just said. I can't even think of anybody knowing I'm out there not asking me. I can't think of anybody who knows that I'm able who would sit around and just cry and be sad and not ask me for stuff when they know it's me. This text assumes that we know the power of prayer. Can you write that down? I'm going to give you a quick insight into the power of prayer. The power of prayer. Prayer is a powerful tool for communicating with our Heavenly Father. Stop. If I said nothing else, that's your question. I can go somewhere in prayer, open my heart, open up my, 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 my verses, my, 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 my mouth, pray back his word and talk to him, and I'm communicating with God. Inherent in that statement is, please listen to me, don't take for granted, wherever you are, God will stop and listen to you. Wow. I got people sitting in the same room with me, I don't want to listen to it is something that God, no matter where we are, will stop. And it just blows my mind that I've been riding down the road and had a 911 experience, and I knew God heard me. That's the beauty of prayer. We don't understand the crowd. I, I gotta go back because I'm going too fast. It is an opportunity to become one with the creator and giver of all things. I now have his attention, I have his love, and I have his power. Every time I get down and pray. Ooh, write that down. I have his attention. I have his love. And I have his power. It's like when your child comes running to you. They may have gotten on your nerves all day long. Any parents listening to me? And you know that that child is really hurt. You will cross mountains, go through hell and high water to dry a tear from your child's eye. Think how much more God will do. Prayer helps us find strength for today and hope for our future. Prayer always strengthens us and allows us to know the future is not over because I can pray. We should actively pray and trust its power to change our circumstances for good. So, it's a mouthful. When I pray, I shouldn't expect just a short-term answer. God has no power to make sure everything lasts forever. There's some of us who have asked God for something when we first got saved, and you might not have thought on it for a while, but God did. I know someone who told me they prayed for God to take the taste of alcohol out of their mouth. They, they were, when they were young, they were, you know, a brand new Christian, they believed so wholeheartedly in that prayer, they never touched alcohol again. I can tell you something, it might sound spooky to you, but I used to suffer badly with allergies. I remember getting down on my knees praying, and I don't know what it was. I knew I tapped into the power of God, but I remember this evangelist, we were going to one of these big, you know, uh, big prayer meetings where they were teaching and preaching, and all I know is they said, they said, take this water, and I took a glass of water, they said, bless it, and believe that it's going to stop your profound allergies. Let me tell you what I did. We were, we were new, I was newly married, we had this big yard. And in this big yard, I had to cut my grass. And my wife will tell you, every time I went to cut the grass, I could only get halfway through it. My eyes would swell. I would sneeze. I was messed up. Do you know I drank that water 
I'm not telling you I don't have any allergies, but I can tell you now that for years, when I couldn't afford it, I would cut my grass and those allergies had subsided. If you don't believe me, you gotta understand your belief and your power of prayer. I can show you so many things that the power of prayer had done, but I just believe God can change your circumstances for good if you trust him tonight. Somebody needs to hang on to that. Go into your house and think about a situation that's been plaguing you. I dare you to pray over it seriously and ask God to remove it. And then act like he's removed it. Walk over it. No matter how you feel, walk through it. No matter what's going on, watch God honor his side of the prayer if you trust him. Your faith life directly correlates to the quality of your prayer. I just said that. I know I was getting ahead of myself. You may not believe in my allergy analogy. <laughs> it rhymes. My allergy analogy. Okay. But it worked. It's real. I don't have the allergies like I used to have. And I believe it's because of the power of prayer. Prayer has the power to change not only people and things around you. Prayer has also the power to change you from the inside out. That is a big thank you, Jesus. Always talk about change me. I'm trying to be forgiven. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be forgiven. I'm trying not to be angry. I'm trying to be a better Christian. I'm not talking about that all the time. You must be guilty. What I'm saying is God can take you from being fearful to being powerful. God can take you from being uh, lonely to being filled in a relationship with him. God can take you from feeling like I'm nothing to making you understand who you're walking with. God can take you from anything. He can get into your heart, change that, and you will see a lion come out of the land because of the power of God. That's what prayer will do. I want you to stick with this text. Matthew 7, 7. We need some scriptures. Write these down. Ask, and it will be given. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open. You can't do any of that if you don't pray. Somebody out there right now, you ought to start asking, start seeking, and start knocking. Maybe that's your problem. You have not done that. You complained about it. You argued about it. But did you seek, ask, and knock? Did you go out there and say, God, I'm going to pray until I get my breakthrough? Matthew 21, 22. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive it if you have faith. I believe that with all my heart. And I'm not one of those faith teachers that tell you the reason you don't get nothing because you don't have enough faith. No. I believe the Bible tells us it only takes a little. If I have a little and I believe the faith is going to work, it, it'll bless my children. It'll bless my. I remember many times we would pray over our children as they went to school, and God somehow allowed them to survive, you know, the, the adolescent years and, you know, through all the years and make it into adulthood and be something. I know that was because of the cover of the prayer of God. You better start covering your family with some prayer so you understand that. Mark 11, 24. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you will receive it, and you have it. So Jesus is saying that's the power of prayer. Well, I got to get to this one. This is the best one. Not the best one, because all scripture is good, but I love this one. John 14, 13, 14. Let me get out of the way. Somebody said, that man crazy. I'm just telling you, whatever you ask in my name, this will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son, if you ask everything in my name. Look at where the power of God is. Come on, we know Philippians 2, you know, that he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. And we know that in there, there's been a name that's been placed above all names. But look what blesses God. When you say the name of Jesus, it's not reflective of the fact that he sacrificed himself and had all power. God said, what you do is you glorify, watch this, that the Father will be glorified in the Son. Jesus said, I can do nothing except my Father Give me the ability to do it. So every time you say, in the name of Jesus, you're really blessing Father God also. God said, you're glorifying me because you believe that the power I put in my son was the power that I placed in him. Ooh, time to quit. We have to have time for prayer. I'll pick that up next week. Um, the importance of a daily communication through prayer cannot be overestimated. It is so important. And it is mentioned over 250 times in Scripture to pray every day. This is a good text. Power stoppers. Man, my self-righteousness, when I give, I want to be seen. I take God's glory. I want to walk around talking about what I did. I did this. I did that. 
and I stop the power of God. Here's the caveat. If you don't want to do it, God has someone who can be grateful that is using you. If you could get on your knees in your house where you are, I feel a different emotion on this Bible study. Can we kind of repent tonight of all of our selfishness? Can we repent tonight for somehow thinking it was me? Look how good I am. Can you repent tonight? Even if you thought too little of yourself. I'm nothing. Everybody else got everything. God said, no. Walk in righteousness. When you get, don't let your left hand go. Put your right hands on. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites just being babbling. Just be sincere. And I will answer. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you. If I've done anything to cut off my covenant, to stop my power in your life, in my stop your power in my life. I'm sorry. Father, as I sit here, I see so many things I need to improve so that I can be what you need me to be. So God, forgive me. I'm going to be more mindful of the blessing you've given me in my life. Amen. We're closing now. Remember to go to our website. If you'd like to give to this ministry, go on the website, see all the things we're doing. Everything we get, we turn over and give it back out again. But God has blessed us to have some powerful programs, actions going on. Check out our youth church on Sunday. Uh, what is our church, Sunday church called? Kingdom Kids. Uh, Kingdom, yes. Kingdom Kids. Kingdom Kids. Amen. I knew that. But anyway, make sure you check that out. And now I'm going to pray for someone's salvation as we close. Pray this prayer for me. Lord, forgive me for my sins. I hear what the preacher is saying. I need that covering. I want to be what you called me to be. Bless me now with a new life. I believe you died and rose again with all power in your hand. And I declare tonight, I am saved. God bless you. If you break that prayer, you got a new life, a new joy, and a new hope. This Pastor Duncan said, see you Sunday morning. Don't forget, we're going to be in our parking lot ministry live. Pray for us. We're trusting God every day. God bless you. Have a great day. To another exciting Bible study with Reverend Dr. James A. Duncan, pastor of Shiloh Baptist Church. Faith study in the Word is designed to keep you fired up about your walk with the Lord. Fired up about our faith study in the Word with Pastor Duncan, author, teacher, and long-term educator with a burning desire to see every believer live a full life of faith in the redeeming power of God. This can only happen when we develop a hunger and thirst for studying the Word, God's Word. Thanks for joining us in tonight's study.